Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask uh, councillors to take their seats. Uh, I think that clock. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Finance Economic Development Committee. Bonjour et bienvenue à la Comité des Finances et Développement Économique pour la, uh, le 7 novembre 2017. Uh, if anyone would like to speak to any item that's on the agenda, if you could please uh, register just under that monitor, and uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, declarations of interest, déclaration d'intérêt, confirmation of minutes, uh, adoption de process verbaux, le 3 octobre 2017, carried. Uh, city Manager's Office, we have a delegation on City of Ottawa participation in the NCC's commercially confidential negotiations for the redevelopment of Le Breton. We'll come back to that. Office of the City Clerk and Solicitor, Bureau du Greffier, uh, Bill 68, Modernizing Ontario's Municipal Legislation Act 2017. Carried. 2018 Elections Amendments to the Signs Bylaw, Third Party Advertisers. Carried. 2018 Elections Amendments to the Contribution Rebate Program. Carried. Uh, five, Amendment to the Composition of Bank Street BIA Board of Management. The approval, oh, I'm sorry, this is to reduce uh, the composition to between five and seven. I think Councillor McKinney is in support of that. Carried. Uh, item six, Appointment to the Downtown Rideau BIA. Appointment of Michel Guibault. Carried. Appointment to the Glebe Business Improvement Area, Nomination Conseil de Gestion de la Zone d'Amélioration Commerciale de Glebe, Eric Kunstadt and Eli Sakley. Appointment to the Canada Central Business Improvement Area, uh, appointment of Mike Lilly. Status update, Finance and Economic Development Committee inquiries and motions for the period ending 27th October 2017. Received. Corporate Services Department, Director General des Services, Mid-Year Procurement Report. Received. Uh, 2018 Interim Property Taxes and Due Dates. As presented, Interim March 15th, Final June 21st, 2018. There's no change according to the Treasurer, that's correct. Carried. Uh, acquisition lease, 2020 Walkley Road Social Services, South Ottawa. Councillor Dean's word, you're okay with that? Uh, item 13, approval for uh, expropriate, to, uh, excuse me, a, an application for approval to expropriate lands for the purpose of the Canada South Link project pursuant to Section 4 of the Expropriations Act. We have a delegation and uh, also a motion by Councillor Moffat. So we'll come back to that. Uh, item 14, uh, Smart City 2.0, Ottawa Smart City Strategy. We have a presentation and people that would like to speak on that. And uh, we'll go back to our first item that we have. Uh, Mr. Kanalakis uh, is going to give us a brief overview of the um, proposal before us with respect to Le Breton, and then we have Mr. Richard Hayter, uh, Director of Community Relations, Building and Constructions Trade Council, who would like to speak to it. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor and uh, members of committee. Um, on this item, um, I just want to give you a quick um, synopsis of the timeline and why this report is before you. In 2013, the NCC initiated a procurement process with respect to the redevelopment of the remaining lands that it holds in Le Breton, totaling 21 hectares uh, in the area. And since that selection process, the NCC has been in commercially confidential negotiations with RLG, which was a successful proponent, with the objective of reaching an agreement on the terms and conditions governing the future redevelopment of the Flats. The City of Ottawa has no direct involvement um, in these commercially confidential negotiations between uh, NCC and the preferred proponent. However, we are certainly an interested party since... Uh, once the federal pr uh, uh, approval process is completed, the project will continue through the city's municipal planning process where citizens will have additional opportunities to engage and provide comments. Both the NCC and RLG have recognized the benefit of the city's early involvement in the negotiations with the preferred proponent of the details of proposal. And as the mayor noted in his letter to members of council on April 12, 2017, 
that in 2016, the NCC invited the City of Ottawa to enter into commercially confidential exploratory discussions with RLG representatives for the purpose of discussing how the City of Ottawa could participate in the process of the redevelopment of Old Breton Flats. And we were engaged in those discussions over the summer up until the end of October until the preferred uh, proponent was actually selected as part of the procurement process of the NCC. There's a willingness by the NCC and now RLG to recognize the importance of City of Ottawa as an interested party to the negotiations. Therefore, this report is, is asking committee and council that the mayor and the city manager be provided with a mandate to participate in the NCC's commercially um, confidential negotiations with the preferred proponent and, if possible, negotiate an agreement in principle with respect to the city's role in the, in the project. The report recommends the principles and interests that will govern the city's participation on the understanding that any decisions resulting from these negotiations will be brought back to committee and council for consideration, public input, and approval. The mandate is designed to be specific enough to provide clear direction with respect to the parameters while still being broad enough to allow the mayor and myself the needed flexibility to negotiate within a dynamic environment in which the city is not a partner. The recommended principles for the city's participation are as follows. One, the redevelopment of the site needs to reflect the goals and intent of the City of Ottawa's official plan, transportation and infrastructure master plans, pedestrian and cycling plans, affordable housing targets, and any other relevant city building policies. Two, city taxpayers must be protected as part of any agreement in principle. Three, role clarification must be provided for any public realm components. Four, ongoing federal government participation must be present. Five, we need to coordinate the bill, uh, uh, taking into consideration the number of projects in and around that site. And any progress on moving the NHL progress uh, franchise to the downtown arena would certainly affect the West End communities and the CTC Centre. And both staff and the mayor believe that any future move should incorporate some consideration of the potential benefits of community impact. And therefore, this report also recommends that myself and the mayor um, be given the authority to be begin these discussions when it's appropriate to do so as a consequence of the redevelopment of Breton Flats. And, and the mayor would ensure the West End councillors are informed on the progress so they can proactively inform their residents and businesses. Following council's approval of a mandate with respect to the city's participation in negotiations between the NCC and the preferred proponent, myself and the mayor will advise NCC of council's mandate and participate in the commercially confidential negotiations as requested. Once the agreement with the NCC and the preferred proponent is finalized and made public, I will be providing council report outlining the results of the negotiations and preliminary discussions with the NCC, the preferred proponent and the Ottawa senators, including any ag agreement in principle prior to the finalization of any agreements and providing information with respect to any delegated authority that was used. There are no financial implications uh, related to the negotiation stage. However, any agreement in principle related to the financial uh, implications, potential financial implications for the city on public realm aspects of the plan, i.e. roads, sewers, parks, or the use of any other eligible financial tools would be subject to standard city processes and brought forward to committee and council for the consideration as part of a report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. So we have uh, one member of the public who would like to speak, uh, Richard Hayter. Uh, I think uh, Richard is right there. If you'd like to come to uh, the, the s where it says public delegations, you've got uh, five minutes. So welcome and thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Vice Chair, City Manager, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen of the gallery. I am pleased to be joined here this morning with managers from the bricklayers, Mr. Oliver Swan, the ropers and sheet metal workers, George Lassard, the heat and frost insulators, Mark Seguin, and the iron workers and rodmen, Don Melvin, sitting behind me. My name is Richard Hader, Director, Community Relations for the Ottawa and Area Building and Construction Trades Council. I am pleased to be here this morning to speak to you about item one on the agenda, the redevelopment of Loretton Flats and the City of Ottawa's structured participation in the project. We support the delegation of authority to the Mayor and City Manager 
as well as hopefully a unanimous council vote, pardon me, to develop an agreement in principle that will assist all parties to the project in achieving common goals. This would benefit Ottawa taxpayers and all Canadians who share in the pride of a vibrant and growing nation's capital. Let me tell you why I support this project. To begin with, Ottawa benefits from a highly skilled, productive and professional workforce very active in building, maintaining, renovating residential, commercial, industrial and public infrastructure projects. They receive top-notch training in area training centers to master new materials and technologies in order to complete large and complex projects on time and on budget. The 20-year Le Breton build is a $4 billion project that will generate an estimated 22,000 man-years of work or restated 44 million hours of direct construction labor. So someone in the workplace working for 40 years would work 80,000 hours. Almost 10% of Canadians are employed in construction. However, each construction job produces about seven supplementary jobs in other industries ranging from manufacturing and distribution to hospitality and financial services. If these percents were applied to auto demographics, then the Le Breton Flats redevelopment project could or would generate probably closer to 154,000 jobs over the 20-year multi-phase construction schedule. A vibrant and disciplined construction industry not only ensures the health of our economy, but supports and supplies good jobs and widespread prosperity for many Ottawa taxpayers. According to Stats Canada, almost 11 jobs are created for each $1 million invested in non-residential construction. Using these factors, then 6.22 of those jobs would be direct, meaning work stemming directly from constructing the building. 2.78 of these jobs are indirect, meaning work stemming from increased activity in related industries such as material suppliers, fabricators, and so on. 1.94 of these jobs are induced, meaning work stemming from the first two sources plus additional work generated throughout the economy. So the Rutten Flats project, Mr. Mayor, will mean a lot to the industry, construction industry as well as other industries and businesses in Ottawa. Additionally, we encourage the approval of FEDCO as the delegated standing committee to further NCC, Rendezvous Le Breton Group, City of Ottawa discussions to successfully move this project forward, and we gladly offer our assistance in whatever role the delegated parties might find helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Buddy, do you have a question of the delegation? Does anyone like to ask Mr. Hayter a question? No. Thank you very much for your presentation. So questions and comments uh, to staff. Councillor Blay, please. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I guess my question relates to um, the, the couple sentences, Steve, that you mentioned about public realm and, and city infrastructure, et cetera. Do we know what type of planning process we think that this will go through yet? Mr. Mayor, the well, Bretton Flats secondary plan is, a, is almost an ancient document in our planning hierarchy, and we, we imagine that at such time as the NCC has reached a, a point, a milestone in their negotiations with the proponent that they can proceed, that the proponent would be seeking a new secondary plan through an official plan amendment, yeah. which would allow us to go. We'd also have rezoning and all of the other downstream planning applications that would come forward. Sure, so there would be a, a secondary plan or a community design plan, but then would it, do you believe it would uh, proceed through through um, a subdivision process or some other site-specific type process? Mr. Mayor, it's a little early to, to have an answer to that question, but it is a very large block of land, and we imagine that once the secondary plan is put in place, there would be some sort of division of the land in, in components, and there would be various agreements and requirements through site plan or subdivision or whatever mechanism we have at the time. So. A little so, too early to know for sure, though. I think as we approach that consideration, I appreciate that's still probably some time away. Subdivisions have significant amount of delegated authority to the local councillor, and uh, decisions that are made at, during that process never come to planning committee or even the full uh, council, and can have enormous potential financial impact on all taxpayers. So, how are we going to? in line with the spirit of the report today, which is to protect taxpayers, how, we're, how are we going to ensure that whether it's this committee or planning committee or, or full council has some say in 
those elements of the subdivision um, that can really blow up costs if you don't uh, if you don't pay particular attention to them. So, Mr. Mayor, I think the secondary planning process, the update of it, will give us a good opportunity to take a look at how those issues will play out. And if at that time committee would wish to give us direction on any of those matters, we can take it and ensure it. Uh, there, you know, I think there's a lot of planning between now and then, and sure. we'll have lots of opportunities to raise these questions again. Okay. And just based on, and I appreciate, you know, we're only one small part of the conversation. Do, do we have any ballpark on how long we're talking about? Mr. Mayor, I think at this stage of the game, we really don't know. Uh, it's, uh, the, the negotiations are still in the commercial and confidential stage. I think w at such time as the NCC has a deal, one could expect a multi-year planning process. Uh, I think publicly the proponents, the preferred proponents, uh, have expressed a desire to move reasonably expeditiously through our process once they have reached their deal with the NCC. But, you know, this is not something that will happen overnight. That's fair, but moving expeditiously and protecting taxpayers' dollars don't often go together. And so I think we'll require some diligence on that to ensure that the spirit of what we're approving today is actually upheld. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Eglai, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a couple of questions around the... Um, the communications back to committee and council uh, and the decision making process. So, um, on um, when you're talking about what's going to happen to the senator's uh, current home and arena, um, there is a reference to getting back to West End councillors uh, with this guy, and I think that's that's completely appropriate. Um, my my question is, though, at some point, do, do those discussions? come back to full committee and council for discussion and approval in the same way that the, the Le Breton uh, Flats piece would? Well, I would think, first of all, those discussions will, be, um, will fall in line after um, the, the, um, the final package and agreement has been brought forward to council on Le Breton. But then that's when you actually have an issue with uh, CTC. There could be some parallel discussions near the end. But my my view on it going forward is that that site will be another uh, planning file effectively um, that will come back through regular city processes because I can only imagine that whatever, I don't know what their plans are yet for it, but I would imagine at some point um, those plans will involve the planning committee and other committees of council and will have to come back into the public forum um, as we, uh, as we um, have those discussions. And, uh, can I just ask, uh, add some sure. of that to your point, Councillor? It, it was uh, Councillors uh, Kadri, whose who's ward the CTC is in, and Councillors Hubley, Wilkinson, and El Shantiri, who all share in the, the positive economic uh, opportunities that the CTC um, brings with it. And uh, I felt it was important that we put that as part of the discussion, even though it's not directly related to Le Breton. It will have an impact, obviously, if the arena moves downtown. And uh, I thought it was important that it, we, we at least have a discussion, even though it's outside of our realm of responsibility. It's a private property owner on private property. But as the city manager said, we will have, uh, you know, if they decide to change it or modify and so on, there'll be a planning a component in. But certainly it was my um, uh, desire to have uh, keep those councillors most directly impacted uh, informed, but then to bring any change or, or any uh, significant move back to uh, committee and council. So thank you for that. And um, so on page five of the report, um, about two-thirds of the way down, it says, um, on the understanding that any decisions resulting from these negotiations will be brought back to committee and council for consideration, public input, and approval. Um, so the use of the word decisions, I'm assuming, is proposed decisions or proposals. In other words, council and committee, or committee and council are still going to have final say as to whether the city goes ahead uh, with those things. Uh, Mr. Mayor, absolutely. The, the, the framework would be to negotiate um, a, an agreement in principle that would come back for approval by council. Okay. And then, and then uh, finally, you use the term any decisions. And I just want clarity here because we've had situations, we have a situation right now where committee and council were told that any changes 
related to Rito Carlton Raceway would be coming back to committee and council. And yet we have a situation where, in fact, that's not happening, where an expansion of the number of tables is going through the committee of adjustments without any input or involvement or decision making by committee or council. So when you use the term any, I just want clarity that you will be coming back to us for our approval and our discussion and approval on anything affecting the project at LaBreton. And it won't be going to another agency, another board, another committee outside of our jurisdiction, unless federal law requires it, obviously, but in general that you will be coming back to us with everything. Well, Mr. Mayor, the plan would be to bring back the entire agreement, the financial implications and all the other components of the agreement to finalize the ability to move this forward. But it also has to enter the planning process as part of the go forward from any agreement. So what happens in the planning process, as you described another example, is still subject to the nuances of how a site gets developed. But our intention is to bring back an entire package that puts in front of council the financial implications, the proposals in terms of how this would get built out, all the public realm, all the components that are in here so that you have that completely in front of you. Okay. So I'll take your word that any means any. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. One more, Councilor Olson. First of all, we're talking about different subjects altogether here. And secondly, any process, if you want to challenge it, go ahead and challenge it. But, I mean, the committee of adjustment is up for an arm length from council. Why are you putting the oath on us to deal with that? For a lawyer, I thought you would know this. I'm not putting the onus on us. If I can respond to that, Mr. Mayor, I'm not putting the onus on that, Councilor. What I'm saying is we all left committee and council with the understanding that any changes in the number of tables will be brought back to us for consideration. And that's where the question comes from. I want to make sure that on this project, which is also a project that impacts on the whole city, that that clarity is there, that that information and communications will flow back and forth between Mr. Kanellakis' office and this committee and council. And I'm quite pleased with the answer I got from Mr. Kanellakis. I think it was clear, it was precise, and it answered the concern. So I thank him for that. Okay. Councilor Hubley, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much for including the West End Councilors in this important discussion about the land use for the current location. I'm hoping that that discussion takes place as part of this whole agreement here and not after this agreement is reached for the simple reason that, you know, when we first had this discussion around Le Breton, we were told by the current owners that within weeks they were going to release a plan for what they wanted to do in that area. It's now almost a year and nothing's come out. My concern is that they would move ahead with Le Breton and tie up that land, that very important piece of property for the West End, tie it up for years by doing nothing with it. So I'd like to know that there's some connection to this final agreement to have some sort of plan in place or at least a good idea for the residents and the councilors for the West End of what exactly is going to be going on there. Yeah, I certainly can confirm that I've raised that perspective with Eugene Melnick when I last met with him when the NHL commissioner was here. I can't give you that guarantee because it's the balls in their court because it's their property and they'll determine what they want to do with it, when they want to do with it. But certainly, you know, I would assume it's not in his interest to allow it to lay vacant. He continues to pay property taxes and operating costs and so on. And, you know, the reason why that aspect of the CTC is in this report is because you and your colleagues and Councilor Caudry as the host ward have indicated we want to see something take place there from an economic development point of view. What that is, my understanding is that the senator's organization has not landed on what the next phase of the CTC's life will hold for it. So I'll certainly relay that information back if this report is passed by council. My other question to this report, directly to this report, is do we have any idea what the cost to the municipal taxpayer is for this potential agreement here? 
outside of the Brownfields piece? Is there other municipal monies going to be put into, invested into this? Well, again, that's part of the whole negotiation process. With respect to the Brownfields, you'll notice that we believe that the Brownfield remediation should be the responsibility of the federal government. And I believe there's a historic reason to support that premise because they, the federal government back in the 50s, were the ones that moved everyone out and bulldozed the whole site. So I firmly believe that it's the responsibility of the federal government to do that, not from our Brownfield program that is pretty limited in scope. So outside of that, is there any potential cost here? Like are we being asked to invest in the arena, for example? You know, is there any other big ticket items to this that we're looking at? Again, my view is that this report gives very clear direction that we want to be helpful, but we don't want to be in the business of providing direct grants to an organization. We believe that if there's a park that's part of the component, just as in any development of a park is built, then we have the responsibility to maintain a public park, for instance. So that's a good example where I think we can offer a contribution. We're already, as you know, offering a significant contribution with the two LRT stations, which is going to benefit that whole site as well. Okay. Thank you very much. And just, you know, and the other thing is you'll notice we want to follow some of the successes of Lansdowne, for instance, that your ticket is your transit pass for game night, for instance. So that's part of the discussion that we want to have because it's worked very well at Lansdowne, and we believe it would do equally as good at La Breton. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Harder, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would presume that this very large city building project, which it is, we're going to have a couple that we are on the agenda right now that we know of. The Civic Trauma Center, the Emergency Trauma Center for Eastern Ontario is going to be another one that will not belong to the local counselor. Make no mistake about that, it will not. In fact, what we've done on our very large files, and I'm sure that Mr. Willis has plans to go ahead in this vein again, is have sponsor groups. The sponsor groups have been extremely effective. Counselor Deans, you know with our Building Better Revitalized Neighborhoods how well that went. You know with the Employment Land Study, well, that was before your time, but we know that Counselor Chair Egley has sat on it, Chair Blais has sat on it, Chair Moffitt has sat on it, Chair Hubley. We have all worked on different sponsor groups as per our interest and our leadership on our particular department. So I would imagine and I trust that that's actually what would be happening. Mr. Kanellakis. Well, yes, this is a large city building project. Certainly the ward counselor would be engaged as you would imagine as part of any planning process, but counsel can also determine once we get to that point, past the confidential negotiations, when we bring back the agreement in principle, counsel certainly has the authority to create a sponsors group that may reflect a cross-section of counsel to steer this project with staff through the process. Because what's more important, I think, than anything else is we don't have this derailed by a particular interest of a counselor. And I think that if you take into account what happened, what could have happened, had that been the way with the Lansdowne project and where that would have gone, sliding very quickly away from where it should have been. I mean, we need to look at the fact, the economic development, the impact of investments in our community. Another one's going to be the Rideau-Carleton. For sure it will be. They want to invest $350 or more million. That's important to the city as a whole. And we all have to be involved in it in some way. But we all have to recognize that some of us have strengths that other ones don't. I recognize that with myself for sure. I hope that all of you do. We're not the best at everything. And, in fact, in this case, if you think about the NCC sponsor group that had, I think, Councillor Deputy Mayor Taylor, Chair Eglin and Chair Blais involved with the NCC for the Parkway, that went very, very well. We had the right people at the table. Take another one right now that I've been waiting a long time to have come forward, 900 Albert. And I would say that we have lost money on the economic development on that project because of delays that have happened over the past two years and longer. So let's be smart about this. Let's be looking at the opportunity that it brings to this city. 
How? 1950, it was the Le Breton. I mean, like almost my entire life, it's been bereft of vital life, vital action in a perfect place in our city. I go back to a gala that the Ottawa Public Library had at the National Art Gallery probably about eight years ago, and Moshe Safdie was the guest speaker. And after he spoke, and it was in the building that he had designed architecturally, and he was asked a question. If you had the opportunity to do something in this city, what would that be? He said, you're not taking advantage of your waterways. You need to take advantage of those. So here we are about eight years later. We're finally in a position where we're going to be able to move forward with a partner that I think that we're still not too sure how that's all going to lay out. But I have confidence that giving the point at this time to the mayor, the city manager, is absolutely what we should be doing. And I have no doubt whatsoever that what we need to know and what you need us to know and what information we need to have dialogue on, and as the different phases go through on this very large project and the other ones that we'll be dealing with, that we will be engaged. And I think that the plan that you've laid out is very good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Deans. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just want to be clear what we're agreeing to here because what I heard Mr. Kanellack say is that the West End councillors will be included in a timely fashion in the discussions, and I agree with that. I think that's fair and reasonable and the right thing to do because obviously the West End is impacted. But what I didn't hear Mr. Kanellack say is that the councillor responsible for Le Breton would be involved in a timely fashion. In fact, what I heard Mr. Kanellack say is that the councillor for Le Breton would be involved at the planning stage after everything was agreed to in principle, and that seems like a difference to me. So am I right in what I heard? Well, Mr. Mayor, I don't think it's a difference. I think the councillor would not be involved, as would other councillors not be involved during the confidential discussions as we're negotiating the agreement with the proponent. We would then come back to full council with that agreement, and my comments to Councillor Harder on the ward councillor was that the ward councillor certainly would be engaged and as per normal processes in terms of development of the planning file of Le Breton, but council can choose to have a sponsor group. That's up to them in terms of bringing together people to shepherd through a file of this nature. Yeah, I mean, I think a sponsor group is always a good idea. I think, as Councillor Harder pointed out, I think it has worked very well. I have no problem with that. But I think to the extent possible, keeping in touch with the ward councillor on something like this, because obviously it has a huge impact on that ward, is a reasonable thing for that councillor to expect as part of this negotiation. I mean, if it's confidential, fine. I'm sure she can keep it confidential. But I'm just worried about the sense that I'm getting that the West End councillors will be involved in those negotiations with CT Centre, but in Le Breton there's a different set of rules, and it concerns me. Yeah, just for clarification, there are no negotiations right now with the CTC and West End councillors because we don't know what's going to happen there. But I can certainly undertake to assure Councillor McKinney that I will, as will the city manager, keep them informed as those negotiations go on. But I think the understanding, to be very clear, is that it's the mayor, it's myself and the city manager in the meetings. We're not going to bring other people into the meetings, but I will undertake to keep her informed because I believe that the ward councillor obviously has the most vested interest. Right. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deans. Councillor Chernyshenko, please. Yes, thank you very much. A couple of points. One on the general process on major projects and involvement of the ward councillor. Most affected, I'll pick up on the mayor's final comments, which I was glad to hear, because if there is one lesson I would want to draw out of Lansdowne, it was that whenever the most affected communities feel that somehow the greater good of the city 
overrules or overrides their own very local, very personal concerns, things they're going to have to live with all the time, then you generate greater opposition than perhaps might have occurred in the first place. Um, it's that sense that we're being steamrollered that gets people going as far as court cases and opposition groups. Uh, and that starts with the councillor. It starts with knowing that their local councillor is very involved, not to the point of confidential negotiations when nobody else should be in the room, but at every other point, yes. Uh, and that's what I take away from the whole Lansdowne incident, other words could be used. Um, a, it is that you, know, you, you, you back people against the wall feeling like, hey, I'm the one most affected. I know it's for the greater good of the city, but I'm the one most affected and I'm not being heard. Uh, and you end up with a, a l much longer, um, more angst-ridden, more expensive process than you might have got in the first place. So that's my warning, if you can call it that, um, lesson um, for, for any of these major projects, whether it's um, you know, a, a Rideau Carlton Raceway or, or Le Breton or, or, or any other. Um, picking up, I suppose, on where we ended up talking about general issues, even though that wasn't the, the intent, but I've heard enough other councillors get that opportunity. I would say, back to some of the points Councillor Eglai was, was raising, our job is to be able to ask questions on major projects. So to know that there will be that moment when we'll have the opportunity to do that. We were told at council when the issue of the raceway was being debated on a very particular point that we would have that opportunity to do it, it would come. So that's the most important thing for us is that we, we, we know that that will still come, that it won't somehow slip by us and you never had the chance to ask those, those key questions. So I think that relates to all of these projects, Le Breton, which is the, <laughs> the item that we're, we're discussing right now, um, knowing that yes, you will have that opportunity is, is critical. That's what we're here for. Right. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor. <coughs> Excuse me, Councillor Caudry, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and good morning. <coughs> First of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this process, especially coming, you know, with the delegation to yourself and to uh, Mr. Kanalakis uh, going forward. Uh, my concerns are related to more so to what may happen with the CTC. I know that's a discussion to be had later on between, you know, the three of you in terms of the two here and the proponent. Having said that, I want to make it very clear that uh, the current community that's already existing there is thoroughly consulted to with what, whatever is chosen for CTC existing. Uh, the reason why I say that, and I go back to Councillor Chernyshenko's point, that I don't want the community to feel that they were left out of the discussion in any way, shape, or form. And I think that is the key for that community, because this community has developed over the last 10, about 12 years around it are on the CTC Center, and they've got concerns already in terms of some of the issues that have arisen. And I just want to uh, talk to Mr. Willis on this, that any future planning application that come for that area, that the re-transformation of Canadian Tire Center be considered before approving or before going forward with a particular application along with Chair Harder, that the intentions of the CTC, whatever they happen to be, are considered into those new processes or new application for development before the development application is put forward, whether it's discussion with the Canada West Owners Group, the current landowners, as well as the CTC, as well as the City Council. So I just want to get that clarification from Mr. Willis and uh, Chair Hutter, I'm sure, will be there in terms of uh, that those new applications that are coming in or have come in will be looking at the CTC's future use. So, Mr. Mayor, it is very premature to talk about what the future use of the CTC will be. That those discussions haven't happened yet, but the city has clearly said that in, in discussing the future of La Breton Flats redevelopment, we want this issue on the table at that time. And uh, I think the city manager and the mayor will certainly take these comments forward that have been raised by all of the West End councillors to ensure that a p viable plan is brought forward for the CTC site. It may or may not need a rezoning depending on what the ultimate future use is. The area is currently has a, a mixed use designation which would allow a vast number of things as it is, but I imagine it would generate a number of planning applications on its own as the city manager has indicated and those would be uh, the opportunity for 
council's deliberation, public consultation, and, and our usual development review process. So I think there'll be more to tell about that after we have advanced the negotiations. But at this stage, we're really too early to say much more. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Willis. But my, again, I'm going to put my concern on the table this morning that uh, I know it may be too soon to talk about those issues, but there is a lot of vacant land in and around CTC, and there will be applications coming forward for those developments. I just want to make sure when those applications come forward, the future, whatever that use is, is con taken into consideration before we approve those new development application in a community that's already housing almost, you know, eight to 10,000 people that are living around that area. So I just want to make that point, Mr. Mayor, and uh, wish you all the best with your negotiations. And, uh, you know, the council needs to be apprised of those negotiations on an ongoing basis, as well as obviously the West End councillors. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you uh, for that um, representation. Councillor Wilkinson, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate the uh, work that's being done on the report was very thorough in how you're going to be proceeding, and I agree with the procedure that you're following there. There's a few questions I have. I have similar concerns to Councillor Crabtree because my ward is right across the Waynesway from there, and, and the residents of Arcadia have already had a lot of problems because of that, especially with their access and things like that, which we've talked to you about before. The, uh, one of the things, I was there when the, the Canadian Tire Centre was built. I was on the Canada Council at the time. And we went through this whole process with them. One of the things that I think is really important in this one to follow that same way is that uh, we didn't have a lot of money in Canada, just like we have no money left now because we spent our capital money mostly. Everything was done was done as it was a new development. This is a new development. So I think it should be following the same procedures we do with other new developments that are more greenfield areas in that the, any new roads are paid for by them, possibly through a new development charge for that. Same thing with new services. All of these things in the new developments, the developer has to pay for directly must some of them and other ones through development charges, which means 90% comes from that area. So in your discussions, I'm hoping that you will make sure that they understand that because they're going to need new infrastructure there, that they have a responsibility to be paying for that. And they can do it in different ways, and I'm okay with that. But I don't want to see the city getting stuck with millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of new infrastructure because of this development. That means the different additional revenue you're going to get from taxes would be all used up for that for 20 or 30 years. There'd be no other benefit. But there's going to be costs with this new development, and, and we have to have some tax revenue coming in to do that. So I'm not sure if you've thought that one through yet, how you're going to handle the development aspect of it, but I just ask that you keep that in mind and that you uh, let us know how things are going. I think what Councillor Deans is talking about a little bit is some interim reports, not on the confidentiality aspects, but on things that you can bring forward on some principles that I think Council would benefit by hearing as it goes along and not wait till the very end and suddenly be surprised, which can sometimes happen. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Monette, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the report seemed very straightforward when I, when I read it. Um, basically, what we're saying is we're giving direction to continue dialogue. Is that correct? So, and the report also states that once the dialogue has been completed with uh, all the groups, it comes back to committee and council. I find it surprising that, you know, we start questioning about the West End councillors being involved and the ward councillors. The West End councillors, from what I understand, is they have a, a definite interest because they have a, a piece of property that could be affected by this in the future and they need to know how they can plan out um, what's going to happen with that piece of property and how to best use it. As far as the urban councillor goes and the ward councillor, I see flashbacks of uh, Lansdowne Park uh, debate where it's going to be bought down. If we have debate at committee and council, that's where the ward councillor would be involved in the process. No way do I uh, want to see another example of Lansdowne where we start micromanaging every little single decision that goes through this project. This project we heard earlier from uh, Richard Ader and uh, Building and Trades, how important it is to the uh, future of our city. 
we need to move forward in a progressive way and not uh, start nitpicking at every single de uh, decision. I think once we, uh, we see it, the uh, dialogue completed, then we have the discussion at committee and council, and then we may, uh, you know, we have any questions that we have, that's the place to, to uh, have those questions. Um, I guess that's more of a statement than a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Councillor Monette. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des autres questions, commentaires, any other questions? No. So on the report as presented, carried. Thank you. Uh, our next item that uh, had delegations uh, is uh, item number 13, application for approval to expropriate lands for the purpose of the Canada South Link project pursuant to Section 4 of the Expropriations Act. Councillor Moffat uh, has a... A technical amendment if you'd like to introduce that and then we'll ask uh, the public delegations uh, who wish to come forward to speak to it. Councillor Moffat, please. Thank you very much. Um, as the Mayor mentioned, it's, a, it's just a, a motion that fixes a, uh, just an error. Uh, so whereas after public release of the Finance and Economic Development Committee Agenda 32, staff indicated there were discrepancies in the background section of the staff report titled Application for Approval to Expropriate Lands for the Purpose of the Canada South Link Project Pursuant to Section 4 of the Expropriations Act, listed as Item 13 on the FICO Agenda. Therefore, be it resolved that the background section of the report be amended as follows. If this would be a good time to get a drink or something, because this is going to take a while. Uh, in the 2017 capital budget, City Council approved funding for the Canada South Link Project involving the widening of Ulrichen Road and West Hunt Club Road from Hope Side Road to Highway 416. Motion TRC 34-5 requires that any funds surplus to Olverson Road West Sun Club in Phase 1 of the TMP be applied to Hope Side Road. Therefore, a preliminary design of the, of the entire Canada South Link, including Hope Side Road, is required. The project is required to create road capacity and the widening will minimize the impact on the Greenbelt lands and to protect the Stony Swamp Conservation Area wetlands. The functional design consists of a Road cross, rural road cross section with paved shoulders within the green belt and an urban cross section for 500 meters on the west side of the Oval Ocean Road and along the north side of Hope Side Road. Two lane roundabouts are included at all intersections except at Moody Drive, where signals are spe specified to reduce impacts on adjacent wetland. Following the completion of the preliminary design and updated cost estimates, the project scope was prioritized and work is proceeding to obtain both federal and provincial approvals. The de de detailed design is underway and construction is expected to start in 2018 subject to project permits and property acquisition. The city must acquire fee simple interest in property from the National Capital Commission and two private property owners to support the widening of the roads. In order to meet the construction timelines, the city requires the ability to acquire property interest by expropriation if necessary. The purpose of this report is to seek council approval for the in initiation of the expropriation proceedings with respect to certain property interests required in connection with the Canada South Link project as more particularly described in the draft bylaw attached here to you as document one. I'm done. Thank you, Councillor Moff. We have a question, Councillor Hart, before yeah, the delegation. I, I'm just wondering where this came from and why it's here. Like, what's the purpose of it? There's a lot of words and stuff like that, but why? The motion or the report? Yeah, the one that you just read. As far as I know, it's, so it's what I read was the, essentially the entire background section of that, of that report, and there are just parts of it that were inaccurate. So I was reading the full... Um, so maybe when staff we'll comes up, one. they can tell us why we needed to okay. do that and what it is that we're supposed to pick up on. There's parts of it that are crossed off that I can show you. That I read the parts that are only the new parts. There's the crossed off parts in the motion as well. So we're going to go to the public. I think maybe if Gordon McNair is coming up, he can just tell us why <laughs> why you're having to do that. Yeah, I think we'll we'll just go to the delegations first, and then we can uh, ask uh, questions of, of uh, Mr. McNair. And so we have. Um, uh, two individuals, Craig uh, Bellinger and Rob Pierce from R.W. Tomlinson. If they would like to uh, come up, you have uh, five minutes, and uh, the delegate seat is right there. Good morning and welcome. If you just push the, uh, the block button, we'll get you underway. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, committee members, Mr. Kanellakis. My name is Rob Pierce. I'm Vice President of Planning and Development with Tomlinson. 
Sitting with me to my right is Craig Ballinger, who is Tomlinson's Environment and Land Project Manager. He handles all of our uh, quarry uh, environmental compliance uh, applications, etc. So is, is, a, uh, is very well versed in, in quarry operations. Uh, before I start, perhaps I'll just ask uh, Craig if he can go to the slide which shows the, uh, the land in question. I'm here today obviously speaking on the Canada South Link Project and its related expropriation of lands that are owned by Tomlinson as part of our Moody Quarry adjacent to Old Richmond Road. Uh, really what's shown on the uh, plan here uh, on the screen, you can see the Hope Side Road, Old Richmond Road traffic circle location. There's an area there where uh, the city is uh, uh, seeking about uh, 0.8 acres of, of land to accommodate a turning circle and some lane improvements. The Tomlinson Quarry is uh, located just east of that and stretches all the way over to Moody and you can see it's, uh, it's outlined uh, in red. Uh, so that's, that's the area that we're talking about. Uh, when I'm speaking as well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the road allowance which is shown to the north and is labeled as such as road allowance. That's an unopened road allowance uh, and it abuts the green belt to the north and uh, our quarry to the south. So as stated in the report, the city is acquiring those lands for the future traffic circle. And I'm here to advise uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, the, and the committee that Tomlinson has been working with city staff on this for some time now. And that in parallel with the expropriation uh, item we are, that is uh, before the committee today, we're in discussions with the real estate group to see if we can arrive at a mutually satisfactory negotiated deal. So Tomlinson is interested in working in a cooperative manner. Uh, with the city to help see this important piece of infrastructure built in 2018. Related to the turning circle and the overall project, there's three main points that I'd like to bring to the committee's uh, attention today. The location of the, the new turning circle is at the westerly entrance to Tomlinson's Quarry. Today, the entrance as you see it, if you were to drive by, is very obvious that it's not a public road, it's gated and signed as such. The entrance is approved by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and is shown on our site plans as such. I'd like to request that FEDCO direct staff that future designs for the turning circle include design features not only to accommodate quarry traffic but also to make the public aware that the easterly leg is not a public road and discourage the intermingling of regular traffic with quarry truck traffic at this entrance. We have made this request directly to staff as well and we believe it can be accommodated and we look forward to working with them on that. The second item that I'd like to bring up is typically mineral extraction requires a 30 meter setback from roads or rights of way. The Hope Side Road, uh, Old Richmond Road future turning circle is shown as needing at its most about 40 meters of depth of Tomlinson land that's presently designated in the official plan as a limestone resource area and zone for mineral extraction. Thus, by taking this 40 meters, uh, it in fact increases any future setbacks by that distance. Any future quarry site plans and setbacks would be subject to review by the Ministry of Natural Resources. To help mitigate this increased setback, and loss of future extraction of the finite aggregate resource in the city. As you know, this quarry is located very close to a lot of uh, you know, ongoing infrastructure needs. Um, I would like to ask the committee to direct staff to support a future request by Tomlinson to the Ministry of Natural Resources to a lesser setback than 30 meters that is typical uh, from a right of way. Now, of course, this would be subject to all the normal reviews and Ministry of Natural Resources review as well. Just asking for the city's cooperation on that particular item. And third and final, I understand the city has been One in discussions minute. with the NCC on the future disposition of the unopened road allowance along the northern limit of the quarry. Tomlinson has an interest in either acquiring this road allowance or working with the NCC to establish a licensing agreement to utilize either some or all of this unopened road allowance as buffer to facilitate quarry operations. As such, I'm asking FEDCO's assistance in facilitating these discussions between Tomlinson, the NCC and City to explore these options. In closing, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing us this opportunity to speak to this item and also for staff for working with us and I look forward to seeing this project move ahead. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Are there any questions of the delegation? 
Councillor Harder, please. Um, when you were talking about uh, making sure the public understands that they don't have access into the quarry, wouldn't that be as simple by, uh, by having a, a gate system uh, with uh, access from your trucks that would only trigger the gate opening? Couldn't that uh, be managed? Uh, there currently is a gate, but I'll let Mr. Bellinger speak to that, Councillor, through the Chair. Mr. Mayor, the, uh, typically the layout of an entrance is uh, with a gate, but it's not an electronic gate. Uh, it's only opened during the times of uh, operation. Um, for this case, uh, the way the site is located, or the way the entrance is located right now and, and the access, there's a gate that's about 30 meters offset from the road, so that whenever vehicles do come in, if they, make a, if they go straight through or whatnot, they have the ability to turn around and then exit. Uh, I think for our design, and we'd be willing to work with staff on this, is that we would plan to have some sort of uh, gating system set up further back um, so that they could turn around. Also, the way the, layout, the way that the site's laid out, there's a scale house that's further up the road, uh, the entrance. So whenever the trucks or if a car came in or whatever, they'd have to go past the scale house at which time, you know, there would be signage and whatnot, they would, they'd be able to turn around as well. See, I don't see this as, a, as, as a, a big mountain to climb here. I think that there's a very easy solution, and technology certainly would allow it. I mean, even on uh, Fallowfield Road, where the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is, if you think about they have a gatehouse there. I mean, no one gets through it. You can turn around. And I think with proper signage that says truck access only, um, we'll get the odd person doing it. But I think that, you know, a commitment by yourselves actually to make something that works with you while working with the staff. I think that would solve the situation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Jubilee, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, uh, Thompson for all their work that they've done with the city on this uh, uh, particular file because it's uh, uh, a very um, important one to the West End councillors. It impacts Councillor Moffat's ward, my ward, Councillor Shirelli's ward, Councillor uh, Cadre's ward. Uh, and it, we're seeing this as the future roadway that will help people get from uh, the West End into the core of the city. Uh, the red, where the red line on that map is, this is why I think it's important to support what uh, Mr. Pierce is asking for. Where the red line is on that map, that's a future trail for the NCC. When there was, this road work is done, they, they have been asking for a parking lot right beside the um, in between the road that uh, Mr. Pierce is talking about and that red line. They're looking at a parking lot there so that people will be able to get out and walk up and down that trail. So I agree with Mr. Pierce that it's important probably to put some directional signs up uh, as well because I can see a lot of people starting to turn into the quarry thinking they're going into the trail. So I would be very supportive of signage in the area to say that that particular entrance is a private entrance. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions of the delegation? No, nope. thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, questions and comments to staff? Did Councillor Harder, did you want an explanation from Mr. McNairn on the technical amendment and what yes. that is? Yes, please, because uh, it's about as clear as mud. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could have it in non Councillor Moffat speak. <laughs> and then. Mr. McNairn, uh, can, you, can you give us a uh, plain language explanation as to what the Moffat motion means? Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor. Um, essentially what happened is typically our reports are well written and we don't have to go through this. Uh, essentially what happened in this particular situation, we have a, refor a report that's in front of the committee. We're asking for approval to move forward to expropriate. It involves uh, two private owner interests and we're also continuing to negotiate with one of them. Uh, with actually with both parties, including Thompson, who you just heard from. But what happened was we found out subsequent to the report being released that there had been a motion that had been approved at an earlier date that had not been taken into account with regards to the report they were asking to approve. So we had to go back and make some amendments to, to that report, and that's why we had to come forward today. Typically that doesn't happen. It was, an, it was an oversight by staff, and that's why we had to come back just to make sure that we're moving forward, especially with an expropriation, uh, that we're very, very uh, clear on it. Councillor Deans, please. Oh, it's gone, but is this a piece of property that was just recently sold by the city? 
No, it's no, it's not, Counselor. Yeah. No, it is that adjacent to it, or? Um, I'm not aware of any lands that we've sold in close proximity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know you're thinking about the OCLDC one. Yeah. Right. That's but is that here? No, no, no. Counselor. No. Okay. That's uh, south of there. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe we we'll turn the lights on, uh, Counselor Blay, please. So, do we have any plans uh, to make use of the, of the road allowance? Um, as was mentioned, we're negotiating with NCC, so we acquire a lot of lands from NCC in addition to what you saw on this plan. So, essentially, the agreement that we made with NCC is that we would do it, um, the land tra transaction in the way of a, a, a land exchange. So, we have lands that they're interested in, we have lands that we need for this particular project. So the whole thing has been put forward on the basis of the land exchange with NCC. That unopened road allowance that Mr. Pierce is refer uh, referring to, that's part of what we had originally um, presented to NCC because that's a very important uh, un unopened road allowance as part of their future network for the pathway system. So based on the discussions that we had with Tomlinson, we did approach NCC saying we know that you're very interested in this pathway but also, um, Tomlinson has approached us uh, about having a setback so that they can uh, increase the aggregate to work there. So is there some way that we can work out a partnership, the three of us, to move forward with this pr uh, project? So we have tabled it with NCC. They said that they're prepared to consider it. They'll have to uh, circulate it and that sort of thing. So that's where we stand today. And if uh, so, by getting the road allowance, the setbacks that uh, the presentation, uh, presenter was talking about would not be the same, et cetera and would increase the volume of aggregate. Is there anything more than we're doing today that could be beneficial in moving that uh, particular point of discussion forward? In my humble opinion, everything that Mr. Pierce has asked, we're already doing that. Staff's already doing that with NCC. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. It's Councillor Blay. Uh, Counts, anyone else? Sorry, I don't have anyone else on the list. No. Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Maybe I'll just add that uh, uh, through this process that's been going on for several years now, uh, I think we've got to give compliments to the NCC because they've been a very engaged partner in this process. Uh, and uh, you know, we all hear horror stories of dealing with the, the NCC, but I have to say that this has been a very positive experience with the NCC and they've been a, a cooperative partner and, and uh, with a shared vision here. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to take that moment to thank right. them for that. Thank you. So on Councillor Moffat's motion, yeah. carried. On the report as amended, carried. Uh, thank you. Our next item that we have uh, guests uh, to speak is Planning Infrastructure and Economic Development, Direction Générale de la Planification de l'Infrastructure de Développement Économique. Uh, Smart City 2.0, Ottawa Smart City Strategy. Uh, John Smith, uh, Director of Economic Development and Long Range Planning, along with uh, Steve Willis, our GM, uh, have a presentation. And then we have, uh, I believe, two delegations that would like to speak to this item. So, uh, Mr. Willis and uh, team, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mary. If you don't have any remarks that you wish to open with, I can proceed to the presentation. Okay. I, I have remarks that you prepared for me, and uh, I'll uh, <laughs> let you deliver them. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present to. I'm appreciate the opportunity to present the, this report, Smart City 2.0, to committee today. I'm making this presentation jointly with Donna Gray, who is the general manager of Service Innovation and Performance, and I will introduce a few other key players at the table here today as well. As committee knows, uh, continually developing Ottawa's standing as a smart city uh, from an economic development and social perspective is and will continue to be a priority for the city. In 2016, Council directed staff to bring forward a smart city strategy, and we are here today to deliver that. 
I want to take this opportunity to thank our council sponsors and champions, councillors Harder, Hubley and Tierney, who were directly involved in assisting us with this today. I will also say that uh, as part of the digital innovation strategy, we also had support from councillors uh, Leeper and Shirelli as well, who provided some input to this process. Together with our staff uh, in in various departments, this strategy has benefited from the partnership of key partners. And, the, uh, and those key partnerships in this case are Invest Ottawa and Michael uh, Trombley, the CEO of Invest Ottawa, is here today with us as, and as part of this presentation. And I also want to acknowledge the very pivotal contribution of Hydro Ottawa and the work of Bryce Conrad and Mark Fernandez, who did a lot of the groundwork for what we're presenting today. We also had dozens of industry, academic, and not-for-profit organizations providing input to this, input to this process. Bringing this forward to you today to outline our strategy is a significant first step. This is a broad, uh, overarching strategy. It will guide our activities over the next couple of years and ensure that the city maintains its competitive edge in the knowledge-based economy of the 21st century. So I, 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 th I, as I said, this has been a truly cross-organizational effort. In addition to the work that our team, so Donna Grave, my colleague, uh, Mark Veneta Cotre, uh, who's part of our uh, in digital innovation process, Michael Trombley as well, the economic development uh, staff, John Smith and Shayla Doherty and Matt Eason, who is not here today, have worked very hard to bring this strategy forward to you. So the, the basically, as I indicated, smart city strategies are becoming uh, a key differentiator that major city regions are using around the world today. And it is part of our position for competitiveness. But Ottawa is not starting from ground zero. We actually are already a smart city, and this is about taking us to the next level. Le concept de ville intelligente et ses stratégies sont en plein essor partout dans le monde. Le concept d'une ville intelligente est stimulé par les poss possibilités et les défis de la mondialisation et de l'urbanisation. Nous voyons le rôle croissant de la technologie comme moyen d'améliorer la qualité de vie et la prospérité économique. La stratégie utilise une approche globale euh, et un plan général. Il est centré, euh, elle est centrée sur trois objectifs et les initiatives qui s'y rattachent. Euh, la stratégie synchronise les partenaires, les intervenants dans les stratégies d'Ottawa en matière de, de villes intelligentes. So as part of the process to build this overarching strategy, we, the process began with work that Hydro Ottawa did where they had an initial smart city uh, workshop with a number of key stakeholders in the community. They generated a background report and we built on that work in partnership, close partnership with Invest Ottawa for what we called a smart city symposium. And then this strategy envisages ongoing community and stakeholder engagement going into the future. And the strategy talks about such initiatives such as a smart city working group, hackathons and forums, uh, online presence uh, with on the city's website in terms of reporting and reporting against key performance, and such activities that Invest Ottawa continues to do, such as Meetup Mondays at Bayview. You know, this, this is important right now because we have other cities that would like to be where Ottawa is at today and they would like to surpass us. So to be, remain globally competitive, and, and we saw through the Amazon bid what that actually means in terms of how we can be competitive with these knowledge-based industries. We need to be able to seize the opportunities to move forward and we need to build on our strengths. And as I said, we're not starting from ground zero. Ottawa has an enormous history of innovation and the entrepreneurship in and around bringing technology to the citizens goes back to the turn of the previous century when electrification was brought broadly to a public utility by a number of key entrepreneurs in the city. And then we have this remarkable family tree of companies that have all originated out of what were Bell Northern Labs at one point and generated so many different companies that are globally renowned and known. And then other cities would crave to have what we already have in terms of the, the organization of Invest Ottawa and the innovation hub that we have at Bayview Yards. And other cities who are writing their 1.0 strategies are seeking to create what we already have. And then we also benefit from enormous partnership potential with all of the federal research organizations which are based in the region in the, in the science and technology, agriculture and agri-food sector and other export-oriented research programs. 
And then Ottawa, the Ottawa region also has a number of very important post-secondary institutions who also contribute this. So we want to be an innovative city. We want to continue to be among the best places to live in North America. So the strategy has three key pillars to it. I'm going to talk about the first two and then I'll hand over to Donna. The first is on the issue of connectivity. And fundamentally, connectivity and bridging the digital divide is a key community concern. And this is our big audacious goal in this strategy. We would like all citizens of this city to have access to high quality internet service in the next number of years. And we are going to be reaching out in the next couple of years to see uh, with the advice of industry leaders on what that minimum standard should be and how we can actually continue to deploy it. We have hundreds of kilometers of new fiber optic broadband uh, cabling going in in the next year as a result of work that our utilities and the private sector telecommunication companies are doing. Every time we open up a road right now for reconstruction, new conduit is laid to, to future-proof those corridors as data corridors for the future. And so this next generation of infrastructure as we continue to deploy it, and then that will enable sensors and data collection, which will allow additional information to come back to the city in terms of its actions, will make us a further and further uh, connected city. So we're going to be developing a further level of a broadband, fiber broadband strategy, where as I said, we're going to bring industry leaders in to advise us on what the standard is. We will report to Council on a regular basis on how well we're doing on deployment more broadly. And where the private sector is not succeeding in making deployment possible, we'll go back and look at strategies where we'll go seek funding partnerships like we've done with natural gas recently from the senior governments or look at some sort of arrangement with the private sector to bring it into other areas which are not currently getting the services. So this will be a, 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 this is a longer term strategy, but we need to be committed to this broad, audacious goal. The second pillar is continuing to do the work on creating the, the role of the smart economy. And this is where our partners in Invest Ottawa are, are quite critical and some of the work we're doing inside our own economic development department are, are there. So we have a knowledge-based sector that is competing ferociously for talent with other city regions in North America. So we need to continue to work with our talent committees, which are comprised of industry, the post-secondary institutions, to make sure that we are getting a good response to attracting talent to this region, to support the businesses who do come. And we have to ensure that we do work to retain that talent in this region. And we need to promote, through Invest Ottawa, entrepreneurship and the scaling up of small enterprises so that they can continue to sell their products throughout Canada and around the world. We also have some specialized activities going on, such as a focus on precision agriculture to bring technologi technological applications to our rural-based economy, which is actually a very large component of our land mass. We are doing already autonomous vehicle test tracks, which was uh, shown quite recently, and, and we have a, a number of innovation and pilot pro uh, programs as well that are part of this pillar of the organization. So at this point, I'll hand over to Donna. The third pillar of the Smart City Strategy is innovative. Just push the button there. Innovative, innovative government focuses really on hacking our business. And what that means is we're looking at new and different ways to think about how we deliver our services now and in the future. It focuses on mobile services, data, and intelligent infrastructure. It contemplates, this strategy contemplates new and different service delivery models, new technology solutions, and new and different ways of engaging and working with partners in our community. And doing this in response to many of the innovations being supported by Invest Ottawa, such as autonomous vehicles, connected homes, connected cards, and mobile services. These innovations, among many, are quickly changing how our residents are interacting with our city services today and will in the future, as well as their expectations about service delivery. People now expect the same level of service from our city that they do with their banks or other telecommunication providers. This is both a challenge and an opportunity for the level of government that has the most direct impact on the daily lives of citizens and also has the most complex set of network of data and systems to pull together and to serve our residents. That is why this council has been at the forefront of making investments in service improvements and digital delivery. So a key focus of this innovative government is to strive to ensure that every business and every citizen has the services and receives the services in the way they want it delivered, when and where it's convenient to them. They should see the city not as a collection of departments, but as one service provider. 
our service must be easy to use, easy to navigate, and simple. It is from this lens that we'll start to focus our journey on digital service delivery and move improvements moving forward. This brings me to the second focus of the strategy, which is around a mobile-first approach. What this means is the ability for people to interact with city services from a mobile device perspective in the context of who they are and where they are. To start this journey, we'll continue to move services, more and more services online, such as parking permits, program registrations, and licenses. And before the end of 2018, we expect to deliver the first city app, the first of many releases that will at first provide citizens with the ability to submit service requests through their mobile phone, receive alerts and notifications in real time, and get city news, public service announcements, and other communications that are tailored to what they need when they want it. <clears throat> We also expect to pilot a chat function online using artificial intelligence, allowing residents to ask questions on the go by texting a virtual agent, limiting the time they need to look on our website or to call our service centre. In 2018, we'll be developing a long-term roadmap that plans all of the digital investments that we will make so that people can move from services delivered in person and paper to digital and online. The third focus area at the core is about data and turning data into insights, helping us understand the patterns of service disruptions and the patterns of service needs so that we can be more responsive in real time to our residents. To do this, starting in 2018, we're going to start to expand our open data program, building on the over 148 data sets we currently have available and our open 311 API. By making more data available, including visualization tools, charts, and maps, we hope to make the data that we have at the city more relevant to the average person to understand how services and decisions are made at City Hall. We hope this will continue to foster feedback and engagement by our residents, innovation from developers, universities, and others in the community, and from the broad ecosystem and network that Invest Ottawa is working in partnership with the city to develop. This is a key asset, we believe, for a smart city and smart city services. The final focus of the Innovative Government Goal is continue to build intelligent infrastructure, improve how we manage our resources and our assets in the delivery of service. The City is already well instrumented with sensors on water mains, street buildings and fleets, and we plan to continue to make investments in connecting our assets with the broader city, city infrastructure. As part of our efforts going forward, we will look to expand Wi-Fi in public spaces and city facilities. We will GPS enable and censor more of our vehicles and explore new solutions in such areas as smart building energy and smart clean fleet. It is the sum of all of these efforts that will drive the kind of innovation that we need to move fo to Ottawa forward in the next chapter of our smart city journey. We will do that by co-creating and co-developing solutions and partners with our uh, Invest Ottawa um, and broader ecosystem. So in terms of next steps and timelines, what does this mean as we move forward? We're going to establish a smart city working group with the assistance of Invest Ottawa and Hydro Water early in the new year. This group will help to guide the development of an action plan to prioritize the initiatives that we plan to do over the period of time moving forward. We will create a measurement framework so we can track progress and implement a governance model so that the decisions are well coordinated and integrated across many city departments and um, external partners. We will also develop the mechanism to consult with the community, engage stakeholders throughout this process. We know they are interested, active and engaged. All of this will lead to a completed action plan by the end of 2018. We plan to present that into the next term of Council as the priorities moving forward and for Council's consideration. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. A lot of work has gone into this. I appreciate it. We have um, now three delegates that we'll hear from and then we'll uh, ask uh, staff questions. Uh, first is Matthew Darwin. Mr. Darwin can... Take a seat and... Uh, yes. Well, just because we've now moved two of our, our panel, could they sit over here with the no, mic? Well, they'll they'll come back once the All delegations right. are over. So uh, we'll have those seats back. Mr. Darwin, welcome. You have five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, uh, my name is Matthew Darwin. I've worked in the high-tech industry for the last uh, 20 years, working in uh, startups and uh, multinational uh, corporations. My, uh, my background is in enterprise software development. I spent all my time in the research and development area. 
Uh, in the last year, I've been spending most of my time actually doing volunteer work, uh, most recently with uh, Ottawa Civic Tech and the Ottawa Community Housing Foundation. My uh, interest areas are in uh, civic engagement, uh, 311 related activities, uh, mapping, uh, open street map, and in cycling. So I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to see this uh, report come forward to council, uh, thinking about the smart city plan. Uh, my concern is um, that we're not actually moving quickly enough. I think um, the, the, pre the presenters uh, talked before about what other cities are doing, and the speed of innovation uh, in technology it continues to increase. So we don't, uh, we don't have time to wait. We need to move uh, quickly. So the timelines presented are um, interesting, but can we do anything faster is my question. So uh, Donna talked a lot about uh, the open data uh, activities. So uh, I, wa I want to give a couple of comments about uh, my use of uh, the city's open data. I, I heard from staff that apparently I'm the number one user of the 311 API, um, but I can't actually use it to do anything yet because the, um, for example, I wanted to create a report that shows how long it takes to resolve a pothole related issue. So the, the, the city doesn't provide where the potholes are other than the ward. Well, that's not really helpful. I really like to know which road the pothole was on. And then I've also heard from um, city staff after my written report last uh, FEDCO meeting that the actual dates and times on the service requests are not actually accurate. So I think there's a pothole still open, but maybe it's already resolved. So I can't generate a report that says, at this intersection, there was this number of potholes, and they took this long to resolve. The data is not there. So, or, um, so I would like the, to, the, to see more effort put into the open data, as indicated by uh, Ms. Gray. Uh, but again, not just add more data sets, but make the existing ones actually usable so I can generate a nice dashboard, and we don't have to rely on city staff to generate those dashboards. Uh, furthermore, I'd like the city to adopt the open data charter, uh, so just like the uh, province uh, of Ontario did earlier this year. The open data charter principles are, uh, there are six of them. Uh, they are open by default, timely and comprehensive, accessible and usable, comparable and interoperable, uh, for improved governance and citizen engagement, and for inclusive development and innovation. I plan to stay uh, involved in Smart City 2.0 activities. Uh, I saw the note about hackathons. I will be participating uh, whenever those things are announced. I'll be creating dashboards. I'll be using open data. And uh, I'd like to thank the committee for their time. Thank you. Great. Oh, questions? Anyone have any questions for Mr. Darwin, Councillor Harder? Yeah, so I guess we should be giving you a medal for your your interest. And it, it is interest that I'm sensing, too. Yes, yes, um, very much. And very positive. So I think that I would like to, I would hope that staff will use you as a resource because, and hope that others, other people in, in the city, we have so many people that are engaged in the city. And uh, this is exactly what they've been waiting for for a long time. And yes, you know, this isn't what I would consider to be Jan Harder time, but then my Jan Harder time is, like, different than most other people probably, but I get what your, your sense of excitement and urgency is what's driving that. So I think if I'm looking at our two general managers, if we can, we, if we can make um, advancements earlier, we certainly will. Am I right? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we'll yes, to. absolutely. And we're continuing to do that this year, and we're working on expanding yeah, the Gray, open sorry, we'll data. Get to, it's just a delegation, because oh. we have th two others to so, go through. Sorry. So. So so to you, you probably know lots of people that are like you, and, uh, and, and get them interested and excited too, because we'll need that help. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great. Uh, anyone else to the delegation? No, thank you, Mr. Darwin. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Martin Great Banks. Not Grand Banks, right? That's Newfoundland. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So. Um, it wasn't really necessarily coming in with a question, but really wanted to show that private sector has, uh, is, is far advanced in this area. So, I, you know, I work with CGI, and we actually already have many, many smart city solutions in other cities in Europe in particular. And so I really wanted to understand how we engage with, um, you know, the smart city um, 
working groups or committees so that we can help accelerate this uh, for Ottawa. Okay, you're talking about in terms of your company doing business with the city? Being able to, to be part of, yeah, helping, you know, whether it's through guidance on um, our experience globally, whether it's our integration experience, whether it's actually solutions we have as well. I think it, it may make sense, Councillor Harder suggested, perhaps to meet with uh, Invest Ottawa as the interface with the private sector and, okay. and the president's just behind you over there. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, to the delegation? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry. To, to answer that question, another one might be through uh, the innovation program with uh, Matt Easton through John Smith's area. There's, uh, that would probably be the best opportunity right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker is Miranda Gray. Is Ms. Gray here? Welcome. Come right to the uh, where the red light is on the microphone. You, you, you can press the button for me. No, I trust you. <laughs> and do you have a PowerPoint, Ms. Gray? Yes, it's coming up in a moment. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Miranda Gray. I'm a resident of Ward 1, and like Matthew, I have been involved in IT for 20 years and involved in this city for just slightly more than that. So if you go ahead to the next slide. Um, my worry here with this report is that we are being a bit uh, pride before a fall. 2010 is a generation ago in, in tech years. Um, yes, we were in the top seven in 2010, but we didn't return to the top 21 until 2016 for the same organization, and there are several other Canadian jurisdictions that have leapt ahead in that time. So we have great potential for this city, but we can miss the window if we wait too long and wait for a perfect plan and ideal timing, and that is my worry here. That is my concern with this report, is uh, that it is not adequate for decision making at this time. If you could go ahead again. Uh, this report has lots of great ideas. It's a wonderful review of the history of our track record, but it does not provide a firm roadmap for our future. It's a good historical summary of some initiatives, but it does miss some critical initiatives in this city, some partners, some players, and some stakeholders in this area. For example, it talks about um, connections and broadband across the city, but it makes no mention of the initiative between Ottawa Community Housing Partners and the National Capital Free Net, which was a prominent event that this council was involved in supporting. Um, it also doesn't mention any of our maker spaces and other places where citizens gather to work on technology. Um, the, a third major concern for me is that it does not mention staff-led innovation. When I am out and about at technical meetups, I meet some of your staff and they talk about their side projects, things they are doing for fun that they can't do in the office, things they would love to do but they can't get permission to do. So I worry that we are not uh, using them as well as we could. My major problem with this document is that the big vision piece is let's keep talking about developing a vision. I don't believe that waterfall projects work well for software. We have seen this in the world of Phoenix. They thought they were going to have a perfect solution and roll it out. They did not take a piecemeal approach and do small projects along the way. And I would prefer that we get to being a wildly successful city through a number of small projects. Um, it's disappointing to me that in four years we are still talking about what we're going to do. And it's going to be well into the first year of the next council before you're at the strategy stage. Many projects in the city do not stop while we wait for a, a new council. Uh, I'm not sure this is one that can afford to wait. So that to me is a major disappointment that there won't be more substantive things coming out before your terms end. If you could go ahead. And my last one is that you set your people free. You need to maintain your uh, innovators in this competitive market. The more innovation that comes to the city, the more people you are competing with for your staff. They have better benefits. They set their people free. Um, so you really need to have a plan to engage the people you have in the city. I saw nothing in this document about internal development with your staff, a Dragon's Den approach, um, a hackathon. I didn't even see them listed as specialist stakeholders who would be engaged in this process or part of your working group. So I recommended that that be part of the plan because if we don't have them, we won't go ahead. Tech projects fail because of adoption, not because of just technology. 
So my concern is that this report neglects people things, and it also seems to neglect the need for funding in the next year and the need to move in the next year. So while I enjoyed the report, I do not find it adequate at this time for you to make decisions. So I would speak against adopting it as is and recommend that you send it back for further work. Okay, thank you. Any questions to the delegation? Thank you. Okay, questions to staff. Councillor El Shantiri, please. I think I should know that by now. Uh, you, talk, you talk about connectivity with the, with the other service provider, like what we did in the past with broadband, and uh, was one of those councillors who were around when we did broadband, but the city at the time was uh, a major contributor or major investor with broadband to be able to provide service to a rural area, which is we know uh, sometimes is not necessarily attractive to the big company uh, based on population or use. So what is our plan to, because we get so many requests and we've seen, as, as you said, we've seen fiber optic popping up in different area and organized by us because the private sector, they're going to those pockets serving them because they know that's where the hamlet is, but they're ignoring the other areas. So what can you tell us about this? It's, uh... So thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a key part of the strategy when we talk about bridging the digital divide because we know it has major social consequences and economic consequences across the city wherever we have gaps in the connectivity level. So on the good news side, we have 430 kilometers of new broadband going in in the next year that's being delivered by private companies and 281 kilometers of dark fiber that Hydro Ottawa is laying in, 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 in as part of its projects as, it, as we do reconstruction projects. When it comes to the rural sector, we are going to have to work with our external advisory panel to set a standard level that we're trying to accomplish and work on some strategies to be, uh, bring service there. We think the city can leverage through its own infrastructure investment projects to bring telecommunications companies to the table to get it to certain hub areas at which point we'll look at further distribution in this. And it, the strategy is going to depend on us making something happen, much like we're doing in the natural gas side of uh, the effort where, you know, the market on its own didn't get there on its own, but we sought senior government support to help bring, it up, bring that out. And we could see ourselves, once we know where the problems are and what the standard is, going to the federal government, the provincial governments, and the private sector and saying, come to the table, let's work on a game plan to get it, this out there. So we're committed to doing this. This is part of our, we're going to report on how far we're getting, how we're doing against it, and we will report to council on, on this about every two to three years on how, what kind of progress we're making on this. Because some of the question we, we get asked from our community, A, the CRTC made a rule said, you know, you know uh, every Canadian should have access to uh, uh, high-speed internet or broadband, and, and yet, they have no teeth, they have no money to come with it. And then, you know, uh, we heard the federal government making investment, but right across Canada for the next five or ten years, so barely make to the cut in some of our area. But I'd be telling you, some of our area to that day don't have even DSL. So, you know, when we talk our city and, well, those people, they feel they're in the city and we don't have Hydro One, as I know Hydro One advancing in this area, we still deal with Hydro One, not Hydro Ottawa. So what's the plan for, for these folks? That's what I'm interested in. So the sorts of things we're looking at, for example, is when the city's procuring any sort of IT infrastructure, we might be able, to be able to leverage our own procurement to get service to areas that wouldn't otherwise happen. Hydro Ottawa, we believe, could work with Hydro One and potentially work in partnership with them in terms of the telecom side is a potential opportunity. We can also bring the private sector companies to the table and ask them how can they ac actually extend it because they're looking for approvals to use our rights of way in many parts mm -hmm. of the city and perhaps we can use, perhaps we have some leverage. We also want the federal government, because they are the regulator in this area, to come to the table and I think we'll make a compelling case to them about how it actually can be addressed in the, in the short to intermediate term. So, you know, we're committed to doing this. We, but the part of it is laying out where are the problems that we need to actually fix first. And this is where we'll, we'll work collectively with your communities to get that to happen. If I may, Mr. Mayor, just 
So the energy, perhaps, is a prime example. So we talked for the longest time how valuable it is to have natural gas in those areas. Yet, until the provincial government decides to inject some money to those, the business community didn't feel it would be sufficient business for them without the primary support to get them there. So, again, I hear all the positive things. And we do now have a fiber optic in a lot of areas, but it's piecemeal and it's not together or it's not organized. You can't get a map to see where they are today, even if you try. So that's why I'm hoping some money would be injected somewhere to be able to serve those communities who otherwise the business doesn't make it on their own. Thank you, Counselor. Mike Tremblay from Invest Ottawa. Just a couple of points. I know the feds have announced lots of money for trying to get ahead of this issue. Much of that money goes to the north, so we really don't see that in urban centers at all. I think the potential we have now is around solving for a new business model that anyone in a high-density area expects, which is it's free. And so what we need to do, we had a great session at our symposium with many of the telecommunications providers. Together, it's difficult to have a conversation where you can go deep. We really need to visit with each one of them one at a time, and that actually is articulated in part of the plan you just saw. I don't think we should come back with some monster plan that deals with this over a five- to ten-year period. We need to pick projects that are in high-density areas where we can have the effect, and we need to work with those telecommunications providers to get at other sectors of the city, recognizing that Ottawa is 80 percent rural, so that we have a strategy for them as well. The way we're going to get at that is by going at each of the telecommunications providers directly, because this, in some respects, is new to them as well, in order to get the right deal for the city of Ottawa. Thank you. Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank them for the work. Mr. Willis, the report is very well done. We got to see previews of it as it was coming together. One of the comments that we heard from the delegations was that we weren't moving fast enough. I know there's a number of initiatives listed in there that we're already doing. I know I was pleasantly surprised when we started actually doing the work on this, how much the city is actually doing in that area. And I wonder if there's a way that we can maybe promote that publicly a little more so that we address that misconception. I think, you know, I take the comments offered by all of the delegations as being thoughtful contributions to the dialogue on this. And I think, you know, their sense of urgency is something we share. And I think some of the points that were raised about how we can engage our own employees and do other things, those are excellent suggestions involved in hackathons and other elements. And I hope we can reach back to this group of people to continue to be champions and push us forward. We have a basic issue, particularly in the third pillar of the strategy. We just talked about the first pillar, which is connectivity. But in the third pillar of the strategy, the city's systems, a lot of which were installed immediately post-amalgamation, are at that point in their life cycle where they need to be replaced. And we will have a digital innovation strategy to this committee later in this year, in the next year, about that. And a lot of those systems, when we build new ones, they can be more oriented to open data. They can be more oriented to mobile. They can be more oriented to a lot of these points that people are talking about. But it does require replacing the backbone architecture in order to make this possible. And we're going to get there, and we're going to bring a plan forward. It won't happen in one big wave. It will happen in steps. But I think we will make considerable progress. And, yes, we have some catch-up to do, but these are considerable investments, and we have to be prudent and prioritize them. Thank you. We have Councillor Deans, please. Thank you. Well, what I took from the public delegations is in their reading of this report, it's all forward-looking and nothing, there's no current initiatives. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us if that's actually the case or if, while you're visioning and thinking about it, you also have concrete initiatives that you're working on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
quite on the connectivity issue, the market is moving quickly, but they're not, as Councillor Alshantari talked about, reaching broadly enough. And so we're going to have to work with them and get those maps put together to understand where the problems are and then develop a strategy to, to close the gap where we see it. That's in one area. In the issue of the uh, community engagement in hacking our business problems alike, Invest Ottawa is already doing hackathons, and we see doing more and more related to that area through Invest Ottawa and their support to industry. And, and my, uh, Michael's group is doing a considerable amount related to the smart economy. On the e-government side, we are doing a number of ongoing initiatives that are genuinely smart. It's just, you know, it's putting them in the framework. Our LED program, which is both an energy saving and a smart, intelligent use of uh, fiscal uh, resources is an enormous initiative is going on. Uh, I, we have a fascinating project that was deployed this year where to, to uh, assess the condition of the pathways, the multi-use pathways, we actually had mobile mounted like Google type uh, sensors on a golf court that ran the entire system. We documented every 10 meters the condition of pathways and we have better data this year in shorter period of time with less resources to get it on the condition of pathways than we've ever had. Yes, we have to work with the backbone architecture issues. Yes, we have to engage many of our most creative staff more than we do, and we get that. And I think we are making progress. And I think that the, the next part that's going to be brought forward, which is the digital innovation strategy, it will answer a lot of what you're asking for, which is that's the more specific plan related to the third pillar on e-government. Yeah, I think we really need to see the specifics of the plan, and it needs to start now, as the public delegation suggested. Well, not that it's not started, but it needs a ramp up now. And I think that we need to take those smaller steps. Um, also, this is a smart city. There's a lot of people involved in that world in this city, and we should be engaging them. And we saw a few of them attend today, and I think that we should really make an effort to ensure that the talent that is here locally is tapped into through this process, and our own talent internal to this city, that we tap into it perhaps in a better way than we have so far. Um, because I was reading in the report about the uh, importance in, of investing in broadband and bridging the digital divide, and you talk about it many times, I was hearkening back to that crazy vote that we had at this table in 2015 when Councillor Leeper and I asked our colleagues uh, to support the CRTC in forcing big companies like Bell to share their fiber optic cables. And uh, Council said no. That was the Luddite move of the term as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Why would you not want to do that? I know there's been a couple of appeals. I think, Bell, I think uh, CRTC won those appeals. Just wondering where we are now. Are the big companies being forced to share their fiber optic cables? As I understand the situation, and Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the CRTC has the ability through its regulatory powers to require them to make them available under commercial terms to other providers and can't hold them exclusively. I think I've got that right. And what impact is that having here locally? I think that it'll have enormous impact because we have a lot of small startup type companies that will be able to get access to the background, backbone infrastructure. We talked about a neutral data exchange in the strategy as well as another initiative that will support small businesses who don't have to store all of their data in the big company systems and be able to store it locally and under Canadian law. So there are a number of initiatives that we can absolutely be working towards that will help that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chernyshenko, please. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I do understand this is still at a, quite a general level and there's not an attempt to be all-encompassing and name every opportunity uh, in, in front of us. Um, and perhaps that's a, a, a lead into uh, a gap or at least of something that isn't explicitly mentioned that I thought might be. Uh, Steve, we've had conversations over the last number of months as we've moved forward with the uh, renewable energy strategy, energy evolution, um, about how important the linkages are, in fact, a great way to to apply a smart city approach is in, for example, energy management, energy management in our buildings, smart buildings, the smart grid, moving energy from where there's surplus to where there isn't enough and avoid polluting forms when there's clean forms available. Um, electric vehicles now are, are, are being seen and are going to be hooked up in, in, in many countries to where when a car is sitting idle unused but it's got a full battery it can actually be tapped into and used by someone who needs it and then replenished off-grid at, at cheaper prices, uh, that sort of thing. So where I'm getting at is I, I don't see a, 
I, I expected to see an explicit mention of the link between this and energy evolution and our air quality and climate change management plan goals. Is that just an oversight, or, or how do you explain that? Mr. Mayor, I think when we bring our energy evolution report forward later this month, the, counselors, the, the points the councillor is making will be, become quite more evident in terms of the relationships and linkages. We have enormous opportunity to use technology to reduce energy. The LED program is a very good example of that. We could reduce the amount of energy all of the city-owned buildings use through technology. We can reduce the carbon emissions of our fleet through additional technology. So I think the answer is we are coming forward with more information. It's just because this report is ahead of the other one with more of the details and later to come. But we do appreciate that there's a huge opportunity to support the city's environmental and air quality and climate change objectives through deployment of these uh, smart city elements. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's mutual support in many ways from Councillor Harder's favorite topic, uh, precision agriculture and, and the possible uh, um, energy efficiencies and, and greenhouse gas emission reductions to, to all sorts of other ways in which these are all interlinked uh, and, and that's why in not seeing a specific mention. So if I understand correctly, it's not so much an oversight, oops, we forgot to put it in as because that particular plan isn't ready, um, you've not wanted to mention it in this in this report. It's not yet been brought forward and formally adopted. On the other hand, though, we do have an air quality climate change management plan that, that has been, so I might put it out to you whether mentioning that here would make sense as you revise this. Thank you. So it, that, that's certainly fair comment. I, I think it's our intent, absolutely, that in addition to the other objectives that we're trying to get, you know, economic development, uh, social equity, and the environmental performance, we see the smart, the smart city strategies being interrelated. And certainly in our, in our, in our, in our uh, as we finalize this, we, we can make sure that that's added as a key linkage. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Angli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, this is a question actually for, uh, for the city manager. Uh, of, of everything that I've heard this morning, um, the one comment that caused me the most concern is that we maybe have hidden assets uh, within the city staff that we're not tapping into. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you I'm asking you the question because it's certainly been my impression since we brought you on that you have gone out of your way to reach out to staff and engage them and empower them. Um, I haven't seen you done a dra do a dragon's den yet. We have a gym, maybe you could be the Kevin. Um, but um, I'd like to hear your comments on that because in terms of your leadership style, what I have seen is that you have been reaching out and engaging our staff and asking them for their ideas, how, how to best move the city forward. Um, so maybe you could comment on some, some of those sort of tangible things that you've been doing and, and just an overall comment on where you see us tapping into that potential that's already within the city um, and frankly already on our payroll and, and something we should be tapping into. So I'd like to hear you on those, on those uh, issues. Um, thank you through the mayor. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll start off with a question that, I, that I'm going to ask uh, Donna Gray to talk about um, some of the specific things that we're doing um, over the next year and the year after because I think the impression that was left by one of the delegations that, you know, uh, this is some high level plan should be turned back and, and that we're not doing anything till, you know, the next ship sails by. I don't think is reflective of the activity and the effort that's happening in the organization right now. And um, we have uh, identified, um, you know, the notion of our service delivery, our people, our service, our people, and our city as the three categories of priorities that we're focusing on from a, from the administration. And in our service area, um, the digital strategy and the transformation of our organization is one of the key um, pillars of, of us moving forward. With our people, um, we are investing an inordinate amount of time. And in fact, November is a significant month where we're doing incredible training. We've done a full month of training for our staff, and we're engaging our staff. We've engaged our staff in unprecedented levels. Certainly with 17,000 employees, someone can get up here and say, geez, you know, I've run into someone who feels that they haven't you know, they haven't contributed. Uh, yeah, I'll find one too. I'll walk out the hallway and someone says, I've got an idea, I wasn't contributed. But from the senior leadership team, we have made, since last October when we finalized the reorganization, we've made great strides 
in engaging our staff. We've had uh, I've had over 15,200 written comments submitted to me about things that we could do to improve the organization. We've taken those, we've analyzed them, we've we've uh, put them into themes. We're actioning uh, many of the things that people have talked about. We have specific action plans to do to do that. Um, we have our webcasts. We have we've been engaging our, our staff in a whole bunch of different areas, but. We have some really wonderful things coming forward in terms of continuous improvement about innovation uh, hubs, how we're going to get our people engaged in things. We have plans for that. And um, um, we're in a period of unprecedented um, staff engagement. So when I saw the comment, and no disrespect to uh, the other Ms. Gray from the delegation, but staff engagement is one of our key pillars of being successful in this organization. We've taken it as a, as a principle of without engaging our staff and encouraging our staff and supporting our staff, we will never get better client service for innovation in this organization. That's a fact. You can't dictate innovation if your staff aren't engaged in it. So I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Gray to give us some examples of specific work that is happening in the organization. I know Councillor Deans, uh, you know, uh, asked that question uh, and uh, Steve talked about it from the broader uh, framework, but I'd like to get to some of the specifics that I think committee needs to have an appreciation of the types of things you're going to see over the next 12 months um, that are very innovative for our organization. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, as Steve mentioned, we did a massive consultation with staff and we took all that information and when uh, Mr. René de Cotre entered the organization as our service transformation lead, he was tasked with going out to every single city department and holding workshops and understanding what are the opportunities to change and deliver and do and think about our services differently. They've been looking at data and pulling together all of those opportunities. And the magic, or I guess the challenge, is taking all of those opportunities that have come from staff, and we have hundreds and hundreds of ideas, and starting to group them in a way that we can start to tackle them and group them together with common technologies, that then we can test those technologies and those solutions to build improvements as we move forward. So those staff have been really active and have been really excited about the opportunity to think about different opportunities. And we've been working very closely with uh, our CIO, uh, Saad Bashir, to look at what are then the creative, innovative technologies. If we brought those technologies to all these business problems, how could we start to address that? So when you look at some of the things that I talk about that we're doing this year in terms of the incremental services we're bringing online, we're now changing how we bring those services online and looking at not bringing them into our old legacy systems, but really thinking differently with new technologies about how we can test and pilot that. So you'll see us testing new things like noise that just went live, fire permits that are coming forward, um, being able to do service requests in an account function. You'll start to see those being developed and created and tested and piloted in new technologies. We're doing, working on the close the loop and the statuses, so you'll start to see by the end of the year those statuses four new statuses being available to residents to be able to track the status of their service requests. In the new year, we want to take those statuses and start to push those out to residents on their mobile devices, depending on where they are and where they're receiving services. In terms of the open data program and how we deal with the open data program, we've taken all the ideas of the department and we're now creating a plan to be working with Invest Ottawa and the Innovation Centre to take those ideas and to work with the, the community that um, Michael is developing, to take those ideas and get those ideas out into the community to hack and think differently about the services that we provide. In the new year as we go forward, what we're going to really do is build all of that around the mobile app and you'll start to see us testing that new technology so that we don't have to build solutions that take a long time, like Miranda said, we will instead be developing, testing, and scaling, very much like the uh, pilot project was doing externally, having the market come in. We're going to now start to do that internally in the organization, testing and piloting and building and moving that forward. So you'll see mobile apps, you'll see alerts, you'll see emergency notifications, you'll see notifications on service requests. 
You'll see the chat function with artificial intelligence, that we want to use that as a test to say, can residents talk back and forth with that new chat technology, and how can we put that in different places in the organization? So I think the trick is, how do we now architect that with our IT so that the investments we're asking of committee as we move forward are prudent and use the best use of new technologies that will deliver results to the problems that people are saying the most important problems for both our residents and for our staff. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to see we're starting to move forward on this because I think we take a lot of credit for what we have in the city with high tech and how it does things. But that was not done by the city. In fact, it was done despite the city. It was done by individuals, by universities, by businesses that are set up here. And they tell me that they will often that the city's particularly procurement policies has actually hindered their development and they could easily go elsewhere. They like living here because we have a very high quality of life here. And that's really important. And part of a city, start city, is actually that quality of life, which I don't see reflected as much as I'd like to in this report. Because without that, we could easily go downhill. The city's not investing as much as they should. If people say it's going too slowly, at least it's going now. And I think that's a big step forward. But we're not paying to put in fiber optic like some cities do. We're getting Hydro Auto to do it. Well, Hydro Auto will put it in where they can, but they have limitations what they can do as well. We just had an all-day session because Councillor Harder and I are on their board going over what we can do and what we have, the, the, the hindrances to get. We can't do everything with Hydro Auto's money. We have to also do it with city money and city operations, and that has not been happening. The staff here want it to happen. I know that. They have, they're taking the right track now, and some of the councillors are doing it. I just can't lock us members when we started to get open data. I had to push that through a committee because the staff didn't want it. Have you remember that? And once they got used to it, and they've now embraced it, which is good, but that put us back I don't know how much time. So I want to see us, when the people say we're not going fast enough, I agree with them, but at least we're starting to move, and I don't want to hinder that movement. But I think there's a lot more we have to do. We have to use the community with a lot of very bright people in this community. We have all sorts of experimental things happening in federal government labs, very far by the federal government. We have it in private centers that are set up by local businesses things. We have put some money into the, the new center at Bayview, which is a big step forward for us, but it's a very small puddle in it. I still hear in the news the other day that Toronto was the center of high tech in Canada. Waterloo is the center of high. They never mention Ottawa, but we have more than they have. We have not done a good job of letting people know what we have. I resent the media saying when they say Ottawa does this, they really mean the federal government. So everybody thinks it's only federal government here and everything they do is a problem to them and they don't pay attention to what I call the real city. And our real city is the people are here, the businesses are here, and they're doing really well and they're doing a lot to improve this city. But we have to change our own policies. Procurement policy, at least has been changed a bit, is still a huge hindrance to them. We brought in some, some companies that we actually high guess and thank Councillor Hubley and I raised that years ago. It took a long time to get it come, but it's very minimal still. I have people that come to me still, and I put them in touch with staff sometimes, and some of them are now working with staff, but they just run into roadblocks of trying to bring something innovative that they want to demonstrate with the city, usually at no cost to the city, One minute. except time and things like that. So I'd like Mr. Mayor to say, yes, go ahead with this. It's a good step forward, but let's not. Let's take it and take a look at some of the things in there and see what we can do as a council and as a city to enhance what the businesses are already doing, because otherwise we could actually go backwards instead of forwards. I need to go forwards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Deans. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a short follow-up. Uh, Ms. Gray, I appreciate the further information that you provided, and I understand it's a complex uh, issue, but um, you did mention that um, there were hundreds of suggestions from city staff, and I'm just, I, I think that it would be useful for committee and council and, frankly, the public to see 
all of those suggestions so that we can think about them, we can maybe react to them, we can maybe make some suggestions around them. So I'm wondering if you'd be prepared to provide a, what we heard kind of document uh, publicly so that we could look at the suggestions that have been made. Mr. Mayor, absolutely, we'd be happy to do that, and that would be a component when we bring forward the plan around how we've integrated those and how we're making decisions about the technology moving forward and some of the opportunities. We'd be happy to do that. But didn't you say you're bringing forward the plan at the end of 2018? We'll bring forward the details of all of the opportunities that are available for us moving forward in the city to council in the first quarter of 2018 for consideration, but then we'll plan out and do the business cases and understand the costs and investments it would take to implement those so priorities. So when could we see the on. What We Heard document? Q1 2018. Okay. At the beginning of Q1? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Uh, President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to add, picking up on a number of threads, uh, both from the delegates and, and a number of the councillors. Um, one of the opportunities we do have in the, in the city is the fact that we are a big government town, but we are also a significant uh, you know, tech city. We have 8% of our labor force are in tech roles. Uh, and one of the uh, areas that comes out of the strat plan that we built for Invest Ottawa is the idea of marketplace. So connecting opportunities uh, that come out of the province, the federal government, and the city with companies that are in our region. Uh, we, uh, Councillor Chernchenko Trin talked a little bit about the environmental sustainability piece in clean tech. We have 5,500 people in Ottawa that are employed by clean tech companies. So putting them to work. Uh, connected to projects, we need to honor the procurement rules, uh, just picking up on Councillor Wilkinson's point, uh, but that is an opportunity. We have an agreement with the federal government right now to be a prototyping center at Bayview, which is a good opportunity for our companies in the region, and I think the same potential exists here with the City of Ottawa. Uh, the province of Ontario has rolled out their um, SBIR-like program, which is uh, copied from the U.S., uh, which is one that we'll end up participating in as well. I think our city could be recognized as being a gov tech center. No one really has claimed that jewel. It's a three and a half trillion dollar global market that we could participate in and we should. It, it's uniquely, uniquely Ottawa. Thank you. Okay. So on the report, it's presented, yeah, carried. Yeah. Uh, notice the motion for consideration at subsequent meeting. Inquiries, written inquiry of one from Councillor Deans on 2017. Thanks. Um, 2017 in Ottawa was a spectacular, spectacular year of celebration and activities. As the year is now coming to an end, it is important that the city, community organizations, and residents be able to review lessons learned and build on accomplishments. Can staff advise on the following? One, what are the next steps for the Ottawa 2017 board? Two, how are we measuring the success of both the local and legacy events? Three, what is the business model for hosting events again in the future? Four, how will the city be engaging with the community, including the Cultural Alliance, Ottawa Tourism, residents, etc., to receive feedback on the success of the celebrations? Five, will the um, Ottawa 2017 Bureau provide council with a final overview of total funds spent? And please also include, like budget, not just funds spent, the budget. And please also include details on how proposed next steps will be reported back to committee and council for review. The other written inquiries? Um, other business? Adjournment? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Merci.